the Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication, where scientists and communication professionals come together to write a better future for communicating science. After I didn't deprive this panel of their walk-up music, which I did for the last one, again, my apologies for that, uh, we're shifting gears a little bit, um, and we're shifting gears toward a, a topic that I think all of us, especially those of us in the room who are, who are tweeting and live tweeting and following the, the feed, um, are, are very aware of, and that's the, the, the omnipresence of, of social media. Um, a, a, a large number of folks, certainly in this country, but worldwide, um, report in surveys that they routinely get part of their news diet from social networks, from Facebook feeds, from Twitter feeds, um, that younger people may be on different social networks now and Facebook is no longer cool, or if Mark Zuckerberg um, has its way, it's gonna be exactly like electricity, meaning not cool, but everywhere. Um, but of course, all of these things are, that's actually a quote, um, all of these things are, are, of course, empirical questions, things that we are beginning to understand um, um, empirically through, through research, and some of the people who are at the very forefront of that research uh, and the application of that are, are here. Uh, we have Nosh Contractor, who will do the introductory talk um, at Northwestern, professor of behavioral sciences. Um, and he's joined by, by discussants Deb Roy, who is a professor at MIT and chief media officer at Twitter, and then Katie Milkman, who is a professor at the Wharton School at Penn. Just one quick uh, comment. The format will be slightly different. We'll do the introductory talk. We'll have some discussion comments, but then uh, the panelists will also question each other, and Deb in particular uh, will take it at the lead and then um, talking amongst each other. I can tell you from just the preparation phone call that we did uh, with, all the, with all the panels that, uh, that uh, I think the, the, that phone call alone that we had in preparation um, would, have, would have been um, interesting for, for every single one of you. So if, if today is half as good as that phone call was, I'm really looking forward to it. So, Nash. So before we go into the thing, I'd like to turn your attention to the last page of our program booklet, the one that says communicate. And what I thought was interesting there is that normally when I look for the word network, it's for looking for information about Wi-Fi. And instead they use the word connect for that, and I think appropriately use the word network to talk about what we're gonna talk about in the session, and that is the actual business of connecting with one another, and as they said, after connecting, the, uh, you know, where we would make professional contracts to co contacts during lunch. Uh, and I wanted to make that distinction because this talk is really about social networks, and while uh, we will be emerging and talking more about social networking tools uh, in the discussion section and in Katie's uh, presentation, uh, what I'm gonna talk about is really the sort of the old-fashioned understanding of social networks. And I'm gonna talk about how we, they still have a need to assemble some uh, issues here in order to be able to leverage social networks for science communication. So I'm gonna start with my key takeaways in case I run out of time and get beaten by the red light. What I wanna say here is that there are some key takeaways that I wanna leave you with. And those key takeaways are that in order to be able to scale up scientific communication, to be able to scale it up to large amounts of people, we need to start by understanding something about the science, about the how of social influence strategies. And the session that we had this morning in particular with Susan and with Bill and uh, was, very, was very important in that particular area. Uh, it talked a lot about how we motivate ourselves in terms of attitudes, et cetera. And so the work that I'm gonna talk about builds on what Bill and Craig and Susan said, but it focuses, again, more importantly on the second topic, which is we also need to take into account the science about who are the touch points in the networks. And then finally, science about the strategic choices about the social media, which I think will come out more in our discussion section, et cetera. So the main focus here for my presentation is the second bullet item that you see there. So I want to start and take a bit of a diversion. I want to talk about the tragedies of neonatal mortality. This is an issue that faces us uh, every year. There are over 300,000 mothers and more than 6 million children who are dying around the time of birth, largely in poor countries. Most of these deaths are due to events that occur during or shortly after delivery, and the death rates in countries like India have fallen, but they are still 10 times greater than in high-income countries like the United States. A few years ago, there was a, a suggestion about a, about a particular topical medicine called chlorohexidine as a possible tool to address this particular tragedy. They did research that chlorohexidine is a topical solution. If applied to the umbilical cord right after birth, it has an Im immediate impact in terms of reducing neonatal mortality. And so there was a study that was done in Nepal 
we found that just applying this one little topical solution alone could reduce neonatal mortality by 24%. There were follow-up publications, follow-up studies that found essentially the same result. Newborn mortality was reduced by about a fifth. So, of course, when these kinds of events occur, these are scientific facts that have amazing, amazing amounts of impacts or potential impacts in society. So the case was made for designing a scale-up for the use of chlorohexidin. This is inexpensive, so it's not a question of the cost. It's a question of how do you take an idea that has been demonstrated scientifically and communicate it to a larger public and to other stakeholders so that it could be uh, made something that is more effective and we can all benefit from something as significant as this based upon this discovery. I'm gonna talk more about this particular scale up later, but first I wanted to back up from here and say, how do we typically deal with these kinds of issues? Well, there's one myth of scientific communication that has come up already a few times today, uh, but I'm just gonna go ahead and repeat it. And that a lot of people who are in the business of communicating science start with the premise that all we need to do is to find a better way to communicate the facts to the public. That's just not true. There is overwhelming evidence that people hold on to their attitudes and behaviors in spite of, not because of facts. How many times have you heard someone say, I don't care what you say, I'm entitled to my opinion? So there are many common approaches of changing behavior which is based on scientific uh, uh, information. Atul Gawande had an article in The New Yorker where he talks about the most common approach to changing behavior is to say to people, please do X. A less common approach is the law and order approach with a stick which says you must do X or face penalties. A third approach is the law and order approach which says you must do X to get incentives. But as he points out correctly, neither penalties nor incentives achieve what we are really after. A system and a culture where X is what people do day in and day out even when no one is watching them. So how do we create that system? How do we create that culture? The literature on social influence, some of which was alluded to this morning, has made a tre tremendous amount of uh, contribution in that regard. Uh, Bob Cialdini has the six key principles of social influence, which says that instead of forcing, focusing only on the facts, people are more likely to have an attitude or a behavior that you want them to have if they see it as reciprocity, people tending to return a favor. If they see it as commitment and consistency, once people have made a decision, they tend to stick with it publicly. If there is social proof, people tend to conform and do what other people are doing. If there is authority, in some cases, yes, authority does help people obey certain kinds of commands. A fifth is liking. People are much more likely to be persuaded by people who they like and who are like them. And then finally, scarcity. People are likely to have an opinion if they feel that what they're getting is something special, something that generates demand. And all of these are important and compelling ways that go beyond the statement that we need to just tell them the facts. These are all strategies that are gonna be helpful. But these are all general strategies. And scaling up on these strategies can be an immense challenge. And so, what I wanna talk about today is moving from the how of social influence, from the strategies that we talked about, to the who. And this is where we look at the work that has been happening in the area of social networks. Uh, right from the 19, 1903 with Gabriel Tarde, and then fo following that, Elihu Katz and Paul Lazarsfeld noted that ideas can be introduced by the mass media, but they spread to the larger publics, with an S, from mass media via opinion leaders. In the field of communication, the word publics is used to refer to small groups of the public that collectively then become called as the public. Everett Rogers in 1962 observed that people are socially influenced by the people they know and trust, as Susan pointed out this morning, when forming an opinion or engaging in a behavior. And I'm gonna posit that as social media fuels the fire hose of information that we get, our first intuition might be to say that this may not be so important, but I'm gonna argue that opinion leaders become even more important in the day of Twitter and other social media than they were in the past. So, who are these trusted opinion leaders? Welcome to the field of social network analysis. There are two pages of aphorisms that I'll talk about, two slides on aphorisms about networks. The first is a social network. It's not what you know, it's who you know. In this country, and for example, for me today, if someone said, well, Nash was asked to give a talk today not because of what he knows, but because of who he knows, some people might think that disgusting and aspersion. 
But in fact, I'm rather pleased to say that that it could be the case here because there's a lot of social network research that shows that most people who accomplish anything do it because of what they know and because of who they know. And in Western cultures, we have to begin to embrace those ideas of the value of the social network. There's a second argument that says, called cognitive social networks. It's not who you know, it's who they think you know. <laughs> we have a perception of who knows who in a group, and we can only act on the basis of our perceptions of who knows who. At the turn of the century, uh, in uh, 19th or 20th century in Pittsburgh, there was a rich industrialist. And he had a friend who was not so well off, but who had a great idea. And he went to the rich industrialist and said, you know, if I only had $10,000, I could do this and it would make me a lot of money. The rich industrialist said, well, I don't want to ruin our friendship by giving this to you. But tomorrow morning when the banks open, you and I can walk into the bank together. And when they see that I have my arms around you, the people in the bank are likely to give you the loan, not because of who, they, who you know, but because of who they think you know in this case. The third is called knowledge networks. It says it's not who you know, it's what they think you know. It's our perceptions of what other people know. We have stereotypes, we have other mechanisms by which we decide who knows what. I teach an undergraduate class on social networks at Northwestern. Uh, it's a class about 85 students, 50 from engineering, 30 from, and the rest from arts and sciences. Um, and uh, what, they, what I find in that class is on the second day of class, I ask them to assemble into teams and tell them that the team has to be some, uh, has talents that they can do something on the web because they have to come up with some kind of web, point, web 2.0 design. Well, lo and behold, as soon as they take a break in class, it's a three hour class, as soon as they take a break in class on the day they, uh, they are supposed to assemble into teams, all of the Asian students in class become instantly popular. <laughs> because everyone else thinks that if you are an Asian, you surely must know something about how to do the web. 50% of the time they are right, other times they are not. But again, it's not who you know, it's what they, the rest of the students, think the Asian students know. And the final slide about cognitive is called Cognitive Knowledge Networks. And this was an ad from what was then Morgan Stanley Dean Witter in 2001. It's not who you know, it's what who you know knows. So this is really taking, raising the power of what you know to who you know. So what am I summarizing here? What I'm saying is that these four ideas of networks are things that we use on a daily basis. So the social networks is who knows who, the cognitive social networks is who knows who knows who, the knowledge networks is who knows what, and the cognitive knowledge networks is who knows who knows what. We ask ourselves these questions every single day. And we make decisions on the basis of that. Some of us are better at the way we leverage these networks than others. And so part of what I'm gonna talk about today is recognizing that these networks have become much more complicated. We now have a multi-dimensional network where some of the nodes are people, some of the nodes are concepts, some of the nodes are keywords, some of the nodes are hashtags. And we are connecting with all of these in incredibly complex ways. And, un and it's impossible for understanding how we leverage our network if we don't see ourselves embedded within all of these different contexts and the media channels that go with them. So what I'm going to uh, take for the rest of the uh, 10 minutes that I have here is quickly try to go through a 3D strategy for levering networks for science communication. The first is discovery. If only we knew what we knew. There are so many places today where we have to ask ourselves the question that we often don't even know what we know and that that is a large part of why we end up spending a lot, a lot of our time reworking issues in, because, in the, uh, because it's too costly to try to find what we know rather than to try to redo it. The second is diagnosis. How do we identify the touch points that can serve as a multiplier for scale up of scientific communication? So this is the place where you diagnose the network and you say, I want to influence this network. Who are the key people in this network that are gonna help me make sure that I can use the best influence strategies in order to scale up? And then finally, design, which is to recommend strategies for the selection of the right social influence strategy, the right touch points, and the right social media channels to be able to scale up scientific communication. So the discovery challenge, we've already talked about it, is who knows who, who knows what, who knows who, and who knows what, who knows what. The diagnosis challenge is why do we want to diagnose a network? Well, it turns out naturally occurring networks are not always efficient or fully functional for what we want to do. There's a book that is, being, uh, that is forthcoming from Brian Southwell, I think in fact it's being re released this week, titled Social Networks and Popular Understanding of Science and Health, Sharing Disparities, where he makes the point quite eloquently that disparities in information sharing via networks lead to pockets of information haves and have nots. For a long time we've known that when we have new media that have come into place, whether it's the television or the newspaper, that these have actually increased everyone's knowledge, but increased the knowledge of those who were knowledgeable much more than it increased the knowledge of those who were not, thereby increasing what was called as the knowledge gap. 
We have to be mindful that even though we have these social media channels, that in fact they may preferentially help some people who are already information rich to get even information richer. And so that's one of the diagnostics that we have to keep in mind when we look at the dissemination of scientific communication in society today. A second part of it is that not all nodes are created equal. Some nodes are particularly well positioned to be touch points to serve as a network multiplier in the scale up effort. So who are the touch points in this network? So this is the interactive 50 seconds of this presentation. Who would you say are the touch points in this network? Fred, Fred okay. John, any others? Sue. Sue, you wanna leave Sam out? <laughs> oh, I heard Sam, very good. Anyone else? Jack, okay. Any others? Okay, so the answer is yes. <laughs> and part of that is looking at why, what we mean by touch points in the network. John is the touch point of the network because he is the super connector. He's connected to more people than anyone else. So what is it good for? If you want to disseminate scientific information, John is the best person to do it. He, or in this case he, is the most connected. He has the most connections. But notice that he has connections to people who are all connected to each other. So instead you could argue that Fred is really the touch point of the network. Fred is the broker in this network. Fred connects people who are not connected to each other. Fred is able to get new ideas from people and put it together, but Fred is also the person who could be a bottleneck in this particular case. But ideally, when you want to disseminate scientific information, he's in a really good position in this network to be able to suggest strategies that might apply to different stakeholders, different communities, because Fred talks to a lot of different people who don't talk to each other and therefore has unique information in terms of devising the strategy, not disseminating the information, but devising the strategy. A third is a pulse taker. Sue and Sam, that was mentioned earlier, they are unique in this network as touch points because they are the fewest degrees of separation from everyone else in the network. It takes the fewest hops to get to them from everyone else. What does that mean? It means that if there is any gossip in the network, any interesting juicy stuff in the network, Sue and Sam are the first likely to find that piece of information. On the other hand, if you want to spread gossip in this network, Sue and Sam are the best people to start with to seed the gossip in the network. So what you've seen is now that there are different types of touch points that can serve different purposes. In case of uh, uh, dissemination of uh, scientific communication, when you try a strategy to disseminate information, Sue and Sam are the people who can tell you how it's being received on the ground, what, what it can be doing, and what information you might want to get back from that. So finally, how do we take the information about who are the touch points and move from diagnosis to design? What are the social influence strategies? What are the touch points? Which media channels should be activated to optimize the speed and the coverage of communicating scientific information to publics or targeted audiences? So back to the case of designing a scale up for the use of chlorohexidine. Uh, as I said, this is a cheap, inexpensive solution that could have tremendous effects in terms of neonatal mortality. Uh, we use this approach to do a uh, scale up of global he family health solutions, including chlorohexidine, as well as a few others, in the province of Bihar in India. This was a project we did in partnership with Robert Hausman of Hausman International, Zach Johnson, Willem Peterson of Sindio Social, LP Singh and his colleagues at the Indian Institute of Health Management Research, and our funders for this project were uh, the Bell, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Wolfgang Munar, Ethan. Wang and Anand Sinha from the India Country Office. So what we had here as a key assumption was that if it's scaling up a scientific communication about family health solutions from a small set of innovation districts where this was already proved to work to a larger set of scale-up districts requires the integration of three, uh, three issues. The appropriate social influence strategies, central touch points, and the right media channels. So what did we do in the study? Interestingly, we decided, and this was largely the India Country Office from the Gates Foundation that decided, that the people we needed to target most were not the end users, but the government officials within these districts because they played a very important role in terms of deciding if and how these family health solutions would be implemented. So we did a network analysis of over 1,300 government officials in the state, government employees in the state of Bihar, all of who were working in one way or another with family health. And we built a family, we built a framework along this, we asked them questions about who do they talk to for advice, who do they share information with, 
What are their current and preferred media choices? And how likely are they to adopt a new idea? Likelihood to adopt means how open am I to adoption? Likelihood to be influenced is how open am I to being influenced? I might like be likely to adopt something, but not likely to be influenced because I do my own independent research and will make a decision based on that. Likelihood to be influenced is I don't know much about this area, but if other people can talk to me about it, I'm willing to be persuaded. So here is what the uh, districts look like. The, date, the dark gray ones are the ones that we wanted to scale up to. The light gray ones were where this particular innovation had already been put into place. So one of the things we found that was interesting here was that when you looked at preferred communication channels, we asked them which channels do you use typically to hear about new ideas and which would you prefer? On the left, what you see there is that face-to-face, -face, the purple line shows that the face-to-face -face was one that was typically, how they typically heard it, about 26, 27%, but even more, as many as 36% would prefer to hear about new ideas face-to-face. -face. You go to the other end of the spectrum and you look at social media, where there are approximately 7% of the people who say they typically hear about family health solutions from social media, but actually less than 5% would prefer to hear about it from social media. So for all the strategies that says, oh, we should use social media, at least on the ground in Bihar, these people do not want to hear about new solutions by, from social media. So what is the recommended action on the basis of this? Well, clearly we had to invest more in face-to-face -face communication than print media. The second is, since we know that the actors do not prefer social media, we have two, two strategies. We could try to address it by either completely dispensing with social media, recognizing that's not gonna work, or if we really thought we wanted to push it, then we need to be able to engage in much more training and incenting the actors to use these kinds of media. Here's a second one we did. We looked at the network and tried to see across the network of 1300, who, which roles tended to be the most influential. And the two that turned out to be the most influential in terms of being touch points were the district, magist district magistrates and the district program managers. So this was not entirely a surprise to us because these were fairly influential people, but there were other important players and stakeholders that were, we thought might have been more influential, but turned out from the network analysis were clearly not as influential as the DMs and the DPMs, as they were called. So obviously, we needed to make sure that we targeted these as our touch points within this particular uh, within this intervention to be able to, have, uh, to improve the chances of scale up. Not all of them were open to adoption. So part of our challenge was if they are influential, it was really important that those are the people who get buy-in before we were able to go further. So the next, and, and towards the end here, the next part is to look at the likelihood to adopt and the likelihood to be influenced. We had asked them questions, how likely are you to adopt something and how likely are you to be influenced? And here are what the heat maps look like. If you look at these districts, the green districts are the ones that have the greatest openness to adoption, the yellow not so much, the red not at all. The, in the each province, you see an I or an S. The I is the innovation symbol, and the S is the scale-up district. What is interesting is that several of the red districts here are I districts, which means that these are districts that have already adopted the innovation, but apparently don't seem to have an appetite for much more innovation. They seem to have already had enough of it. So there's something called innovation burnout, and part of what we see here is how some districts have said, enough already, I'm not ready to take any more innovation. Same thing was true for likelihood to be influenced. Here again, we had a red, green, and yellow map to show a heat map to show where the influence is likely to happen. And the question then is, how do we take these pretty pictures and make them actionable? So one example of how we make that actionable was, oops, I, I think I may have skipped a slide here. But what, what we did out here was we were able to say that depending on whether a district was likely to be, let me see if I have it ahead and then I'll come back to it. I don't see that slide yet. So basically what this would mean here is that if we find a district is open to adoption, then what we do is take the persuasion strategies and influence strategies of providing them more factual information. If on the other hand they're not open to adoption, but they're likely to be influenced, then we need more complex social influence strategies of the kind that we had talked about before. So again, what this does is gives us an opportunity to see what their attitudes are, which people in the network within the district, outside the district, would be most influential, and what strategies, influence strategies, would they be able to use. We also looked at knowledge sharing between districts. That is, to what extent are people in one district saying that they would be willing to be influenced by people from other districts, or they seek advice from other districts. And what we thought here was interesting was the case of the two districts on the left, Siwan and Gopalganj. These were two districts that seemed to have a lot of ties to each other. 
Not surprisingly, we found out that, in fact, there were earlier attempts made at what was called twinning these two districts so that one of them, which was an innovation district, was going to help the other one, which was a scale-up district. So in a sense, this became a good diagnostic that that twinning effort, in fact, was working quite well. The same could be also said for other twinning efforts, such as the two blue districts on the bottom right-hand corner there. The final issue was it's not only important to figure out which districts that will likely be adopting this, but to provide a sequencing strategy to say that if you wanted to see how you could disseminate scientific information across these different districts, are there particular sequences that you could start with first that would then cascade down to subsequent districts? And here what we looked at was the asymmetric nature of which districts were more reliant on which other districts, and use that asymmetric information, so there's such as the big arrow, the arrowheads that you look at between Kagaria and Begulsarai at the bottom there, you see that Begulsarai is much more reliant on Kagaria than vice versa. And what this does is it provides you with insight about where you might want which district should come first and then which district should come later. So again, based on this, we'd say that in high adoption readiness, focus on factual information. This was the slide I thought I was missing about the merits of the adoption. And in districts which have lower adoption readiness, focus on persuasive communication strategies, which requires dialogue. And then in that case, the best medium is face-to-face -face communication. Um, the same thing applies in the likelihood to be influenced. I'm looking at time. And so I would say then in, in closing, I, I want to go back to the same points that I started this presentation with. And that is when you want to look at social networks and you want to look at scientific communicating, uh, scaling up the communication of science, in addition to looking at the motivation and the attitudes of individuals, there is a lot of power to be gained by looking at the science of networks that allow us to see structurally which touch points are most likely going to serve as multipliers for our scale-up effect. And of course, as we will be talking about again in the next in the discussion here and also in Katie's presentation, we also have to make we also need to know more about the science of making strategic choices associated with the new social networking tools and new social media, things like Facebook and so on. Again, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to comments from the colleagues. Thanks for that fantastic talk. It was really interesting. Um, I'm going to turn to a slightly different topic that's also related to social networks to spur a conversation here. So what I'm going to actually start with is an, a study you probably saw for the first time in Psych 101 by Solomon Ash that was done in 1955, and that feels to me very relevant to this conversation about social networks. So, as you may remember, in the ASH experiments, undergraduates were brought into a laboratory and shown two index cards. One index card had three lines on it, and the second index card had a single line. And the task was simple. People had to decide which line of those three matched the length of the line etched alone on a single card. So this is a very simple task unless you first hear a series of confederates announce the same judgment that's incorrect one after one after one. It turns out when this is the case, people actually make the wrong judgment about 37% of the time following those confederates, whereas the error rate is about 0% when there's no such influence. So this was an incredibly important study in demonstrating that when we see other people exhibit behaviors, even when they're wrong, we tend to conform. There's a very strong pressure to conform. Decades of social science research have, sh have shown that it's not only the case that when we observe conformity, we conform, but also when it's described to us. So when we're told 75% of your peers, for instance, are engaging in a certain behavior, that is one way in which we can be influenced to engage in that behavior at a higher rate. And this has been widely used, for instance, in messaging on, on college campuses to try to increase engagement in healthy behaviors like safe sex and drinking less. In a fabulous example of how this has been widely used, Opower is a company that actually sends out messages to people about their electricity usage each month, and not only tells you about your own usage, but about the usage of your neighbors. And that social pressure, the pressure to conform, has been shown to reduce electricity usage among households reliably over long periods of time. Even more closely related to social networks, in some fabulous research done with historical data from the Framingham Heart Project, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler have shown that it's not only 
what's described to us about the behavior of our peers or what we observe in close range in a situation like the ASH experiments, but in fact, when we see people in our social networks engaging in certain behaviors or experiencing certain things, that can affect us as well. So obesity spreads through social networks. Our contacts one, two, three steps removed from us influence our obesity rates, our smoking rates, our happiness rates, and our loneliness. So then the question I find particularly interesting is how all of these social norms phenomena will interact with new social networking technologies. And one experiment I wanted to highlight that I think is really fascinating on this topic was done in a recent election cycle on Facebook with 61 million people, possibly the largest experiment I've ever read about. And this experiment, prospective voters in one condition were motivated to vote by seeing a message with information about those friends of theirs who had also voted. And seeing that information not only increased your likelihood to vote over a control get out the vote message, but also influenced your connections. And so the question I wanted to pose today to this panel is really about how these new social networking technologies like Facebook and Twitter and herd behavior, which I've just discussed, may interact and how we can both leverage those complementarities to communicate about science more effectively and also what some of the risks may be. And so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> and and I think you guys are going to spend a, a few minutes, Deb, um, posing some questions, and then we'll go to the broader forum. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so I only saw Nashir's presentation for the first time over lunch today. So <clears throat> I've had about an hour to, to absorb it. Um, so one question I asked you over lunch is, um, what is, what's new? Why are you giving us this message now as opposed to 50 years ago or 30 years ago, you know, you talked about mass media um, and then the flow through social influencers and, you know, there's a critical second step and hence the need for network analysis. So if I roll back the clock pre-Twitter, pre-Facebook, so we don't actually have to go back that far, um, we could still map out. It would be more work and we'd have uh, less information about what the social network looks like, say, in these districts in India. Um, but all the same techniques could still apply. So are, are you um, uh, suggesting something has changed, or is this just sort of uh, basic ideas that have not been worked out until now? So just to kind of level set yeah. a little bit. So it, it, I think that, uh, so first of all, social network analysis preceded a lot of this stuff. And many of the same kinds of social network studies going back to the Katz, Katz and Lazarsfeld work and then Everett Rogers and several other very influential scholars along the way have been looking at networks along the way. I think that today we are at the perfect storm in order to be able to really use networks in the way I've been describing for four reasons. One is I think there have been lots of advancement in social science theories on why we choose to link with other people, why we choose to connect with them. Um, and that, that's just increasing now because part of these networks are not just involving individuals, but also these multidimensional networks where you have different kinds of channels like Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. So the first is that I think we have a much better theoretical understanding today than we did before. The second is that we also have much better network analytic methods. Network analysis has been around for a long time, but until about 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago at best, it was primarily a descriptive field. It showed you pictures, it showed you density, it told you who was central, but in the last decade and a half, network analysis has made huge advances in what I would call inferential and confirmatory analytic techniques that allow us to test scientific claims and therefore to be able to test the theories that we talked about. Even if you had the theories and the methods, until recently you didn't have a lot of the data. A big data set in the past would have been 200 or 300 nodes. Now because of the availability of big data and broad data and mashed data, I think we are now able to move to the realm where we're actually looking at networks. Uh, and certainly in our research group, we routinely look at networks that are in the hundreds of thousands. And the fourth important thing is that you can have a theory, data, and methods, but if you didn't have the computational infrastructure to analyze these, you would not have been able to do it. So for those four reasons, theory, data, methods, and computational infrastructure, I think today we're in a much better position to make this kind of work actionable. Is there a fifth, which is um, a lot of the people you're trying to influence are now networked through technology? Yes. Everyone's got the phones. Right. So, so there's an ability to act. 
Yes, so that yes, right? I think that, that that's just, in my, in my explanation, I was thinking of that as the substrate, but Deb, you're absolutely right. It is the fact that people are more networked through a lot of different affordances, and so that not only provides the data, but actually makes it possible to influence them through these various strategies. I would agree with that. Okay, I have a couple more questions, but we can, looks like you're. I have, I have one quick question that's just a follow on on that. Sure. I noticed that you, you found that people actually felt they were being communicated with through social media uh -huh. more frequently than they would prefer. Yes. And do you think that that is the status quo, or do you think that there are ways for that to change, that it's likely to change? What's your evaluation? So when this is now, remember, we're talking about India. We're talking about Bihar, one of the poorest states in India. We're also talking about a place where there is not a lot, where it's not necessarily that there's a lack of computers, but there's a lack of electricity. So that makes it a little more difficult to indulge in social media when the basic infrastructure suffers. That said, when I was there and talking to them about these results, I asked them, I said, you know, is it just because people don't use it? And I was actually surprised to hear. They said, well, actually, a lot of these people use Facebook and Twitter all the time. They just think about that as something they do for fun, the social in social media, not for professional work. So I think part of what that shows is that across the world, there are different norms that emerge and then continue to evolve about this. LinkedIn in this country is seen as something that is fairly well accepted in terms of professional networking, et cetera. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar, but in China and in India, most companies will strongly condemn you for using LinkedIn because they see that the only reason to have a LinkedIn account is because you want to quit your present job and take another job. <laughs> so there are variances in, in norms, and these things are going to evolve over time. So, so another um, question that I guess came up from our lunch discussion, you, you explained that uh, with uh, television, the exact same dynamic of uh, certain people who already had more knowledge, kind of self-selecting, yeah. tune in and, and uh, get um, more advantage. Yeah. And so there's a kind of acceleration of these, uh, yes. the, sort of this knowledge gap. Um, and you see the same now with, uh, with Facebook, Twitter, um, everyone may have access, but this differentiated use. So it almost makes one think there's a kind of natural tendency which may only get worse the more connected we become for, for knowledge gaps. And a lot of what I heard in your, the piece of work you did in Bihar is you know, analyze the network and I think there's, you know, one can imagine many ways of intervening uh, to um, sort of counterbalance. But if it is a natural tendency, uh, then I guess one way to put it is you almost need an unnatural force to counteract. And do you have a, a way of helping us think about how, how, is that, how is that sustainable? So historically, this is the issue, the knowledge gap hypothesis, that every time we have a new medium that is introduced, we think this is going to be the democratizing medium, this is going to make people connect across, it's going to be improving the, you know, it's going to bring back the public square, it's going to bring back more of civil dialogue, et cetera, and we have a history of seeing that that's not necessarily the case. That we see that often what these new media are doing is helping people connect strongly, but most strongly with people like themselves. So we see the development of these echo chambers, as they are called, right? If we looked at some of the iconic work that was done, both in terms of talk radio or in terms of blogs, both of which were advocated as bringing dialogue across, they actually created polarization. And I think that this is particularly relevant in the area of scientific communication, where we already see that people were interested in talking to like-minded others and get continu continually reinforced by that, et cetera. How do we intervene in this particular situation? I think part of what you do is by looking at the network and by looking at the individuals who are in the best position to service the bridges, the brokers. That's where you look at those individuals and you target those individuals as people who can help you move from what might be their natural tendencies to what you described as possibly unnatural tendencies for them. But I think that there is an opportunity to do this and we've seen that it often happens accidentally. What we are talking about is taking what happens sometimes accidentally and making it happen more frequently by design. All right. Um, actually, I, I, will, I will not miss the opportunity now we have the, uh, that we have the chief media officer of Twitter here. There's actually a question that, that I will ask, um, and, and, but didn't come from me, and that's, I think, for all three of you. Um, and that's where you see online social networks going in the next five to 10 years. Um, 
both in terms of, I mean, more generally, but also, you know, related to the topic that we're talking about today? Well, um, not to give an evasive answer, <laughs> but um, when you look five to ten years out, I, I mean, I have difficulty, at, so just say a couple of, uh, you know, things about why. Um, when I think about, so I think a lot about Twitter. Uh, so my, my role as chief media scientist is uh, to think about what is Twitter as a communication medium, how is it interacting with other mediums, and what does that mean? for the sort of the media ecosystem and for Twitter. Um, and in, in kind of looking at the history of communication, I just look back 100 years and a new communication medium like the telephone or the radio or the television, each of them had, of course, sweeping effects across business, government, everyday life. Um, and they also took a couple of decades uh, to develop and uh, deploy at scale. And so there was, you know, a generation or two of time for us to absorb uh, the impact. And in comparison, if you look at what happened with the convergence of sort of the, commu the communication mediums and uh, computers, we oh. end up with the internet, which gave a base to do things like Twitter, which I think in its first uh, original form, you know, this idea of let's create a, a public sort of social broadcast mechanism, a dispatch system, uh, took weeks to implement. And the reason it, the time is so short is you can sort of cook up a new communication medium, sort of new properties in your head and go from that to uh, software and then have, of course, all the hardware ready to deploy. So there's, we've kind of gone from a, um, a solid to a liquid phase of communication mediums, right? There's this kind of liquidity where uh, how many people here have uh, uh, used Snapchat? Wow, that's pretty good. Uh, so about one in one in twenty or one in fifteen. I mean, this uh, if the uh, description I read of its uh, creation is correct, it was somewhere between two and three weeks from initial uh, you know idea um, to, by by three people to implementation, and now it's. Uh, you know, a, uh, I think a bona fide new communication medium that has its own properties distinct from uh, other networks. So a long-winded evasion of where will we be in five to ten years that when we've, you know, we really are going through the space change in how uh, mediums that I think are disti as distinctive as radio is from television is from telephone, um, where uh, the pri sort of the private versus public, the spread of a message uh, in, in the case of a telephone is defined by the way copper wire radiates. Radio is public because of the way electromagnetic waves radiate. And uh, those are sort of constrained by the physics. And suddenly you can write software, write a few lines and tweak uh, how private, how public, what modality and so forth. So it's kind of hard to um, imagine for me anyways in five to ten years if every uh, three, three people in a, in a dorm room can cook up a new medium and let it loose. Um, it's it's uh, sort of we've gone to the, into this phase where it's like uh, cultural adoption is what determines what spreads mm -hmm. and how fast. So, long and evasive. Not not evasive. I think that I, I, you point out the fact that 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 there is an ecosystem that is just proliferating very rapidly with new species. It took a long time for each of the old ones to be displaced. And one of the things we've learned historically is that when uh, the radio came in in place of the newspaper and sort of displaced the newspaper as the main place where people got their news, the newspapers had to redefine what they did in order to survive. When television came and became the place where news came, then radio had to redefine itself in terms of what else it did. You see, it went to radio theater and went to other kinds of issues because, newspaper, because news was now being handled mostly on television. What we're seeing now is that that ecosystem has just exploded. You talked about Snapchat. Uh, how many of you had heard about or participated in something called chat roulette? I get a few hands, fewer than Snapchat. This was one of those random ideas that came about the same way, where you go click on chat roulette, and you would be randomly connected to someone else who was in chat roulette. And you can choose either to chat with them, or you could click on it, and they would be gone, and you would get another person. As you can imagine, like a lot of, like a lot of these communication technologies, the first examples of why they became killer apps actually had to do more with adult entertainment than anything else. 
Some of them stick, some of them don't. Chat roulette is clearly not as popular today as it was about two years ago. But that notion of uh, creating what are these sort of this ecosystem of media channels, media sources, um, and also recognizing that many of them are what um, Gina Neff and David Stark referred to as permanent beta. They're never going to get completely hardened. They're constantly being moved, and they're always going to be in beta. And I think that that's, again, something that we have to confront that we didn't think about in terms of past media. So, yeah, uh, Paul Weiss, UCLA. A couple of question, related questions uh, on Nash's uh, presentation, but, but uh, for everybody. Uh, first, how correlated are what people say influences them to what actually does? And are there tools that you would use now for analyzing those networks or your or others' networks without going in, you know, perturbatively and asking people questions? I can go first. Um, that's actually a very interesting question, and we just uh, submitted a paper where we analyzed data where we were looking at another project that I could have spoken about today. It was, uh, we were looking at the city of Chicago and its efforts to convince uh, low-income communities to embrace principles from the Chicago Climate Action Plan. So this is based on the fact that low-income people are less interested in immediately adhering to what the city might want in terms of um, waste management, transportation, energy consumption when it comes to improving the climate in Chicago because they have other more pressing issues in their mind. Bottom line is we asked them a bunch of questions about who they went to and what were their motivations for going to those individuals. We looked at the data of the people they said they went to, the gender, the ethnicity, the profession, the age, and so on and so forth. And then we analyzed that using some of the confirmatory techniques that I was talking about earlier. But then we independently also asked them at the end of the survey, do you seek advice from people from the same gender, from the same ethnicity? And it was remarkable that they would say, oh no, gender doesn't matter at all in terms of who I seek advice from. While the network data they had given us just 15 minutes earlier showed that that was the strongest predictor of who they would go to. So there clearly is a difference between what people are reporting uh, as the people they seek advice and what principles they think are influencing them in terms of their social influence. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that too. I'll take that one too. Uh, I teach a class that's all about influence and, and the most amazing thing to me is how frequently I show an example to my students. For instance, I show them, um, I show them an example that may be familiar to this group of the Asian disease problem where reframing the same choice about lives saved versus lives lost results in dramatically different decisions about what kind of policy to implement. People want to avoid losses and so we see reversals. but. Everyone's startled by this. No one expects it. So a tremendous amount of influence is actually unexpected to us. And one that I think is particularly interesting when thinking about networks that are always startles people is the fact that when we make an effort to help someone in our network, we're actually also hurting someone who doesn't have as strong of a network connection. And this is one I think we fail to think about often when we're making, making references for friends and uh, and, and currying favor. Every time that you do a favor for someone else, someone who doesn't have that social network structure is actually harmed. And so this is one of the reasons that we worry a lot about minorities and women not having such strong network connections because they're not going to receive those same recommendations and favors that are so impactful. Let me, let me just remind folks um, as we're waiting, and I think there's one other question from the floor right back there. Um, but um, as we're waiting, um, the, if you tweet your, if you would like to tweet your questions, you can do that at the Sackler hashtag, uh, and also email them at uh, SacklerWebcast uh, at nas.edu. So let's go to this, and then come back to some of the questions from outside. <clears throat> hey, Aaron Hurtis, I'm with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, I think it would be a good thing if more scientists were participating in social networks and communicating online through a lot of these tools. And I'm wondering if you can point to some scientists or scientific institutions that you think have been successful. And I'm wondering if you can help me respond to the three biggest barriers I run into when I talk to scientists about this. Uh, they usually say, I don't have time. The format doesn't seem right for communicating my research accurately, especially for Twitter. They don't like the 140 character limit. Um, and there's a lot of trepidness around 
social media being silly or social media being another way that detractors of science could waste their time or make them feel bad. Um, so I'm wondering what some ways are to help them overcome some of those barriers. Well, you know, uh, a couple of days ago I tweeted that 140 characters uh, limits the depth of self-expression the same way a breath's worth of words limits self-expression. You can always tweet again. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I follow uh, a handful of uh, academics on Twitter, and it's interesting to see, you know, different, different ways it's used. Uh, but, you know, short, uh, again, you know, broadcasts of uh, a new paper you've published, something, something that you find interesting, to essentially have kind of a, a stream of pointers to things that are interesting. You don't have to capture it all, of course, in, in short messages. So it's a, it's a certain format that, um, that works for certain kinds of communication, not others. Um, I think it's interesting, the, um, certainly the, the kind of um, perception that uh, I think Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, uh, all of these mediums have that it, it is kind of a a lightweight thing, uh, in part comes from the fact that, of course, they're often born from some, you know, some very specific and small uh, use case from which it grows, um, and is early on is kind of a, a sort of experiment, a completely experimental thing where people don't necessarily know what the use case will be, and it evolves over time. So I think part of that is a kind of a natural evolution. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I think making study of successful uh, scientists that, that are using it. That's some of the patterns I've seen. And if I can insert myself just really quickly here, one of the, one of the, the empirical answers to that question also is we, we just did a study published in The Scientist that, uh, that actually showed that there's a correlation among Twitter presence for scientists, and this was just for the leading nanoscientists, a study actually we did with Elizabeth Corley, who is here on day three, um, and then their H index, meaning the academic productivity. So which direction the causality goes is a different question, but one way or the other, some of the most productive folks um, in that area end up using social media, so they're apparently not constrained by the 140 characters. You know, and I'm just thinking, and, and the other point was I don't have time uh, to tweet. I don't have time to, with all the social media, I've got work to do. Um, and that's kind of what this meeting is about, which is you could say that not just about tweeting, but about spending time uh, communicating to the public. I don't have time for that. I've got more research to do. And in fact, there's some truth to that. The more time you spend trying to make something digestible, et cetera, et cetera, you're taking away time from the, 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 the real work. Um, and it's sort of finding that balance. Um, I think compounded on that is when it's, a, uh, when it's something new, uh, you're not just learning how to um, reallocate your efforts between speaking and writing, but if it's some uh, new tools you have to learn, that's a, additional work on top. And so there's going to be natural resistance. But I think um, at the base, if the, if the new uh, way to communicate has affordances that you know, let you get the word out um, far and wide, that that sort of fits what you're trying to do. Um, once you get over that learning curve, it, it's just really a, a back to that basic question, how much time do you want to spend communicating versus doing the work? I think that um, I, I think that your point is, is well-founded, but I'm not too concerned about it in the long term. I think I've seen even within the last few years where about five or six years ago, there were some fairly controversial cases where individuals who had a strong social media presence uh, that supposedly that hurt them in terms of their tenure and promotion at really well-known institutions. That culture has changed a lot in the last few years. I think that now increasingly I actually see people who in their tenure and promotion portfolio will include some metric of their Twitter presence, et cetera. The second is it also helps them to, it helps me and others to feel, to, to be more honest and get a more honest um, feedback on the kind of work we do. I, I learn a lot from the tweets that I see and from the tweets that people send towards me and point me towards because that gives me a sense of what, where things are on the ground. And I think the reason I'm not so concerned about it is that at least in the graduate student community that I'm exposed to, I think that they are very powerful users of, of Twitter. I've gone to many, many events such as this, especially events where there are younger students and graduate students, et cetera. They'll come up to me. I have one of my former students is uh, now at Northeastern doing a postdoc. His name is Brian Keegan. 
and he has loads and loads of followers, and people come up to me and go, you know Brian Keegan? Wow. <laughs> so I, I'm very optimistic about the future. My claim to fame. <laughs> it's, excellent. it's all about who you know. Right? All. Um, gentleman back there, and then here in the front. I'm wondering if, uh, in terms of using social networks to communicate science, if it's a matter of finding the right node to reach places where we aren't getting the message out or getting the news out, uh, or if it's a matter of uh, growing or you know seeding an emerging voice in a in a part of the network that we haven't reached before, if if, there, or if that's the same thing really, if if there's a difference between growing it and finding the voice that's already there and just isn't you know, doing what we want it to do, uh, to be very mechanical and Machiavellian about it. Is there, is, it, is, it, is there a difference between the two things, or is it, you know, is it, how would that work? I, I could go first. What, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think it's both. I think that clearly, you know, one is a precursor to the other. If you don't find which are the dark spots in the network, then it becomes difficult to be able to persuade them. But at that point, once you've found those, uh, it becomes, again, very important to be able to, uh, to exploit the network or grow the network to get there. I did a, did a project once where I found that this was an international um, information share, a knowledge sharing network for a community of practice. And there was a very vibrant community in Japan. And then there was a very vibrant community in Europe. But there was exactly one link between two people that connected these two vibrant communities. And I, I refer to that as the isthmus of Japan because if that one link went, if that either one person or the link went, this community of pra practice would get fragmented. So that's part of where the diagnostics and networks become so powerful. Sorry, this takes a second to warm up. Um, we were talking about this also over lunch, that it's not just about who you choose nor their place in the network, but also it's about the message. And so that's, um, that's something we were talking about a lot. And um, I'm gonna be talking about this a lot tomorrow as well, that the way you craft your message, the things you can do to make it more likely to propagate through the network. And so it's choosing the right people, matching them with the right message, um, and, and also finally making sure that, that they're strategically located. No, no, go ahead, go ahead please. I think it's a fascinating discussion. You're also talking about networks that are already there. And what I'm fascinated about with new technologies is this creation of ad hoc networks, like the blink of an eye. Do you have any insights about tools that you can use to help and support in those networks as you move forward? Well, I guess there's, there's many ways to um, see new networks appear. Um, let me just... Uh, mention one, we're using uh, the hashtag pound Sackler here, and if you go and follow that stream of comments, and it looked like there was a healthy stream when I, when I last checked, um, one way to interpret what that stream is doing is bringing together a conversation amongst a group of people, some of, many of whom are probably in this room, uh, some of, are we streaming? We are. So some who are not, and uh, when there's an interesting comment and it gets retweeted, It'll uh, end up in someone's timeline who wasn't even aware there was uh, a Sackler event happening. So there is a ad hoc dynamic social network that has formed uh, around that hashtag that may lead to long-lasting uh, links uh, beyond. So, um, in fact, what we're doing, forget Twitter for a moment, we're, we're all in a room. I have met almost, I, actually everyone here is new for me. Um, this will probably lead not just to a temporary network because we're physically together, but links long lasting. All of those same dynamics uh, sort of replicate, get echoed, but get amplified in different ways with, um, with the, the new networks that are getting layered on top. So that's, this is one example. But um, it seems like the most powerful examples, they tend to have uh, pre existing natural correlates. They're just in, in uh, certain ways getting transformed, uh, sort of amplified. Another question here. Hi, um, my name is uh, Nira Jane. I work with Mitsubishi Electric Research Lab. So I'm a mechanical engineer here, sort of not really involved with science communication. Um, but I do work in control systems, which is very relevant to network control theory and a lot of what you're talking about, um, sort of in determining what decisions to make to affect uh, a network. Um, one of the things you brought up that was mentioned in a side comment was risk. Um, so you have 
so many different networks and people interacting with one another and then new networks coming up. Um, and I was wondering if um, the same way that we can use them in a positive way to affect science communication, there's also this huge risk of misinformation uh, spreading. And if you could uh, comment on that. I think that um, I think the example that I was giving about how when you have polarized groups of these echo chambers, uh, depending on which side, which of those echo chambers you're in, you'd probably think the other chamber is more nefarious in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, et cetera. So there is a natural tendency for these things uh, to, to develop in, in these networks. And I think that the ways in which we think about how we might want to uh, circumvent that is to say if there is a way to open up the dialogue, that that would be better for both sides of it, even though it might not be something that it pushes people out of their comfort zone, et cetera. Um, but one of the things we learned from the terrorist networks that were involved with 9-11 is that if you look at the network, visually you can see that someone like Mohammed Atta was, if you remember that name from a few years ago, that he was supposedly the kingpin amongst all of them. But what was not so visible by looking at the network, but from the an analytics, is that it would take as many as a th uh, removing at least a third of the links for that network to really fragment, that there is a certain robustness in these networks. And so the, 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 the flip side of that is think about networks in terms of their robustness, in terms of their fragility, and making sure that if you're interested in having a network uh, in, in to support a, a network that is in a positive direction, that it doesn't have the same issues of fragility, et cetera, within it. I think that this question actually comes back to the question I posed after talking a bit about herding mm -hmm. and the risks that I think there may be uh, as we see these new so social networking technologies coming out. We know that people have a tendency to herd, and this is actually these technologies can support herding at a faster and more dramatic rate. The snowball effect can be larger and larger. So on the one hand, I think there's a risk there. On the flip side, if we can harness it, it may provide us with ways to get people to herd faster in positive directions. And also, an interesting thing about it is that prior generations didn't have the technology to track this kind of word of mouth nearly so cleanly. And so now, if we actually see a snowball effect taking place on the web, for instance, or if, if a viral video is taking off and it's communicating misinformation, well, at least we're going to be aware of it. It's going to be tracked. There's going to be a trace. And we can try to take action to, counterva to countervail any negative forces that might be in play. So I think that's promising. Yeah, I, I think there's no doubt that with these new technologies, there's uh, a lot of uh, the, the, the risk of misinformation. You know, just one example, during the, um, the Boston Marathon mm -hmm. bombing, mm -hmm. uh, what began as a um, a little yep. bit of misinformation that would not have really spread on police scanners. Uh, again, a medium not, although it's a broadcast radio, not meant for tens of thousands of people to be tuned into. Um, and a, a suspect was named, and uh, you know the uh, the misinformation spread, and it took a long time to bring that, uh, you know, uh, rein that in. I think. Uh, this just points to how early days it is, and you know, if you are a, a news um, consumer, to make sense of there's this information you're getting, but in fact, no matter how many times you hear it, you can trace it all back to one source versus multiple. You know, that might be a clue to how much um, certainty you can place or how much uh, belief uh, you should have in the quality. Um, we have no such tools today, and so it leads to the kind of havoc that we saw um, until things settled down uh, around the information. So I, I think it's just, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, both on the, you know, on sort of all sides of the divide to, to um, uh, not just get better educated, but also have better tooling. Because some of this, you just, uh, as, a, as an individual, as a human being, you can't make sense of without uh, new layers of technology that sit on top to help you make sense. I think I want to pivot quickly on a point that Katie made, and that, and you pointed out that, you know, on the plus side, if there is something nefarious and risky that is being propagated, and you can pick it up on Twitter, and you, as somebody who wants to countervail it, can find it. Uh, but there is also the dark web, and that there are parts of the network where people are able to mobilize without necessarily giving visibility to everyone else. Even something as innocuous as Facebook has what I call as secret pages. And so these are people, pages that invite large numbers of people by invitation only. And what goes on in those secret pages is not something that the public is generally privy to. So you could have 
those kinds of undercurrents happening and bubbling without necessarily being able to see it in the general public. So we have to be mindful of the dark side of the web in that sense. Before we go back to the floor, let me just touch on, on two questions that, are, that actually get at, at, at a more applied aspect of this whole thing. One, one question is relating to the notion of tailoring our messages that we've heard about this morning um, and, and asks to which degree, even though they may be different sub-networks or, or clusters, to which degree that, that idea becomes more and more difficult to implement on social media, meaning targeting specific audiences and tailoring messages to those audiences and connecting with those audiences in a way that's, that's meaningful to them um, as audiences. Um, and then the, the second one also, uh, the, the uh, uh, applied question saying, well, is it possible or are there characteristics of a message, and this Katie may get it to talk tomorrow, are there characteristics of a message that make it, especially science communication, that makes it more likely to be successful um, in, in social media? And I know the New York Times study at some point looked at likely, likely um, hood of being forwarded, um, but uh, so probably for all three of you. All right, well, I'll preview what I'm gonna be talking about tomorrow a bit, but yes, we do know things that can increase the likelihood of propagation of content. Um, one thing is emotionality that may not be intuitive, so intuitive things matter. Making something more interesting, more surprising, more useful, all of those things will increase the likelihood of propagating a message. But we actually have found that um, the more emotional your message is, the more likely people are going to want to talk about it with others because sharing those kinds of emotional experiences increases bonds. We also find that specific emotions that are highly activating, like awe or anger or anxiety, that people need to manage in some way are, are widely shared because people want to discuss them with others in order to make sense of them. So to the extent that you can frame your research as having uh, emotionally resonant implications or to use it to generate anger, awe, excitement, or even anxiety, that's going to increase chatter about it. So those are just a few previews of what I'll talk about more extensively tomorrow. Any comments on the idea that, uh, that it's, is it increasingly difficult to connect with audiences in particular ways, with, in, uh, especially when it comes to you know, taking into account their particular cultural values, motivations, and so on, things we talked about this morning, or is that easier now that I can yeah. quickly hashtag a conversation. I almost feel like I'm not understanding the question properly because it sort of my, my first instinct is to say it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's become easier um, in various ways to uh, have a lot more detailed information about who your message is, receive, is being received by and being able to customize uh, and, and micro-target uh, messaging. Um, just look at the last elections. Um, so maybe, maybe the... Uh, person has something else in mind. Well, I think sure. that part of the issue there, that what, is, what to me seems intriguing about this question is that in the field of communication certainly, for many years at the end of the era of mass communication as we knew it, uh, there were several scholars and public intellectuals who lamented the fact that the large audience, we never come together again except for you know, media events like the Olympics or like the, uh, the Queen's coronation or the royal wedding and so on, but that in general we never come together because we are now, the media is so fragmented. And I think that while that was being referred to as a bug, I think what your question and your response there points out that it's actually a feature that in many ways we are able to be able to target much more um, specifically messages that, right, that even though we may want to accomplish a common good, there may be different ways of accomplishing it, and therefore being, having the opportunity of having these segmented messaging strategies are actually a feature, not a bug. Yeah, I didn't mean to say that. Um, maybe I, I, <laughs> I put a little bit more neutrally because I'm, uh, I was trying to answer the question, is it easier or harder uh, to deliver specific messages to small, you know, targeted groups? It's easier. Um, I don't think that's all upside, though. Um, so, for example, just if your goal is to reach millions of people and have mass reach, it makes it very difficult to differentiate the message. Uh, so if you uh, talk to someone who is sort of creating the messaging, uh, it's difficult to come up with many messages for many, many groups and sort of keep everything straight. Um, and I think there is a loss in not having um, common ground in what people know about. So it's not, not simply a, a feature. There's not a, either row. It's a buggy feature. Buggy feature. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back and then come back here. 
Uh, so my question uh, links the, the previous question to some of the discussion this morning in which there was the, uh, this morning stressed the importance of scientists and researchers having warmth in their communication. And uh, you mentioned, you know, this discussion has been all about using social media. So how do you use social media and communicate that warmth, especially if you're limited to 140 characters? Modicon. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> I mean, I imagine Katie's got a lot to say about this, but uh, uh, 140 characters uh, make up words. Of course, choose your words wisely. Uh, you can have warmth uh, or you can have icy cold words. Uh, it is language in the end that we're using. Yeah, I, I would, I'll, I'll talk more about how we do content analysis of language and look at what propagates tomorrow, um, both on the New York Times website and when we look at actual scientists summarizing their own work. But it, it's remarkable how much you can communicate uh, with just a few words about emotion. So I would argue that actually 140 characters is plenty of space. You know, again, if you look at um, when communicating science, uh, a tweet might be um, a a micro summary or the equivalent of a headline to get the attention of uh, you know, your follower and bring them to uh, the more detailed piece. And um, just as a, in a headline or a short summary, you can convey emotion. Um, the, the same goes for what you might pack into a tweet. Question right here, then here, and then next in the back there. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, terrific uh, panel, terrific comments today. Uh, Yvonne Clearwater from NASA. So we've had uh, a lot of success like other organizations in um, inviting people to launches and other media uh, events and uh, selecting them on the basis of number of followers uh, in their various venues. Terrible echo on this. Um, what would you suggest are better analytics or, or, or greater analytics that we could be using besides just sheer numbers of followers in trying to really increase the, the reach, the spread, the impact of uh, individualized messaging? Uh, well, I, I think certainly uh, it, this is another place where I think um, with time we'll have better tools because it's not merely uh, the number of followers, but of course, depending on the, the goals of your event, uh, if someone has, um, you know, a, a thousand followers, but the people that are following this person are influential in their own right, they're the kind of people you're trying to reach. Um, if you're having a, a conference on um, health practices, you might want to reach medical experts and not reach uh, all of Justin Bieber's followers. So you, having Bieber to, at your event might have its own upside, but not actually accomplish directly what you're trying to do. Um, so you know, looking at far more than the, the, uh, the numbers is important. I wish I could point you to the tool where you could key in the, the type of community or influence or impact you're trying to have and assign a score to a person that looks into their network uh, if you know of such a tool, let me know. Um, but I, I will say that it's a, a, a mere matter of engineering um, in, in terms of theoretically how, how one would go about building something like that. Um, I, I can imagine, but it hasn't, as far as I know, been built yet. So there are some tools that are trying to do this, uh, not very well. One in particular is called Clout, K-L-O-U-T, which is fairly controversial. Uh, because they keep their formula secret. Uh, they don't segment it, and so they, they, they may not serve that particular goal, but I imagine that these are things that, are, that everyone is thinking about in the space, because as you, as you have the situation, there are people who are gonna ask the question you do. There are two metrics in particular that I think are important here. One is that if you take two people who have a large number of followers, but the followers are the same people, then those are not necessarily the two best people to bring in in order to incre increase the net range. So you're looking to have people who are followers still interested in the topic you want, but are different followers. So that's one sort of measure of range of diversity that network scholars have come up with. A second one is I think what Deb was touching on, but I fear to say that I understand everything he's saying now, but with the point being that you can take a person who's a follower and say, how many followers does that person's followers have? 
and how many followers does that person's followers' followers have? Because that gives you a much more long-range metric of this influence. And in many ways, in a, in a naive way, this is in fact what Google's page rank algorithm does, where it says a page is the top search because it's linked to other pages, that it's linked to by other pages, which is linked to by other prestigious pages, which is linked to by other prestigious pages. So there's a measure that mathematically is referred to as the eigenvector that is used to compute who might be the best people you would want to put into something like no, that. No, that's not at all what I had in mind. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. I know. But that's, that's pretty much. But one other piece on top, which is you might also want to characterize what a person on the following, you know, the followers, what are they interested in? Uh, what are they known for? So analyzing not just the network, but also the what content. flows through the network to understand. And, and you can pretty quickly, you know, if you analyze. Uh, my tweets uh, get a sense that I'm interested in cognitive science, I'm interested in media, I'm interested in marketing, the certain areas that um, we pretty much wear on our sleeves. And so doing that analysis of content and network topology together. You know. Thank you, guys. Um, and then there's one question back there. I think it's Mary, if I can see the silhouette. And right. I think it may be the question that has no answer. Uh, Mary Nucci from Rutgers University. And in, in our work there, we've talked with people about how they get information, and often information that they bring that's scientific-based is incorrect. So that, for example, someone once said that the reason why she won't eat canola oil, it's made from mustard plants, which comes from the same uh, source of mustard gas. And she found that information on the web. So. We're here about science communication, and I think that uh, social media is incredibly powerful, but how do we deal with social media that disseminates information that's incorrect and to some cases perhaps damaging or uh, contradictory to how we should behave? That may be a question with no answer, but I can't lose the opportunity to mention that many of you may have gone to a website where there's a very famous quote that you could see. It says, don't, be, don't believe everything you read on the web by Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I, I think those are, those are really good last words for this panel. So, so thank you one more time to the, to the panel.